once again. Dr. Chris Smith, virologist, is with us again now to answer various questions from you and from me. Hi, Chris, how are you? Hello, Kim. I'm very well at the moment and thankfully, I hope, coronavirus free. Well, I hope so too. Um, The government in the UK has just announced a big close down all pubs, cafes and restaurants and gyms throughout the UK. Did you anticipate that? Yes and no. I was actually sitting listening to the press conference as part of a network radio programme on the UK airwaves. And over the week, because I first did this with them on Thursday last week, and that was when the initial steps were announced. And then, of course, on Monday, Tuesday of this week, more press conferences announced, more lockdowns, more stringency, school manoeuvres, changes to the working patterns for the average person and what that left behind were a number of gaping gaps because what we were seeing is people being urged to embrace these social distancing measures but at the same time bars cafes hotels golf clubs restaurants all remained resolutely open so not surprisingly lots of people were resolutely filling them yes and uh, and obviously not doing what the in- what was intended and also if you if you tell people not to go to a bar or a restaurant, but then the restaurant isn't told by the government to close, then that business is in complete jeopardy. So it was very unfair on those businesses, because if you're in the hospitality industry and the government is saying to your clientele, you mustn't go to these places, but they're not saying you have to shut your restaurant, those people are left dangling because they have no recourse to insurance, business insurance to cover loss of revenue, etc. So their business is basically in danger of imploding and talking to these kind of business leaders and people who run these chains and things, the wage roll is you know enormous and if you've got no cash flow coming in and you're paying all your staff wages your your business survival time is measured really in days and that's the position many found themselves in so in some respects i think that that they, this was kind of planned because the chancellor had a bunch of measures ready to support those people and announce those too and um you know on the one hand it sounds like really great news that they're looking after everybody but in the back of my mind I'm very consciously aware that national debt is about to go through the absolute roof and that both myself my children and my neighbors we're all going to be paying for this for a really long time because this is this is going to be costing billions a week what they're doing to support everyone and we have no choice I mean we have to do this we've got to look after everybody but the the price tag is eye-watering um all this uh, recent decision making by Boris Johnson and his government is, seems to be based on the Imperial College Disease Modelling Study, which is said to have been highly influential in changing the approach to the disease both in the US and the UK. Why? What did it say? Well, the paper that's been referred to is by Neil Ferguson who unfortunately himself has now put himself into isolation with all the symptoms of this new coronavirus. He tweeted that late last, late, late earlier this week, actually. And um, what this very well-written, clear paper says, which you can get completely freely over the internet, actually, and it's, a, it's very well-written because it's actually put over in very clear language that... Actually, I sent a copy to my brother, who he did geography and geology at university, and he's a school teacher, and he read it through cover to cover and said, yeah, what, what, a, what a really interesting paper. So anyone can grab hold of that. If you look up Neil Ferguson, Imperial College, COVID, you'll find the copy of it. You can download it. And what it set out in very clear terms, which perhaps was what the government needed to help them to make their mind up about what to do about this, was this is what happens if we go business as usual and we do nothing. And it presented clearly what the likely anticipated trajectory of cases would be, therefore what the death toll would be, because it showed what the intensive care capacity was and that the anticipated number of cases was 30 times bigger than what the intensive care could possibly be hoped ever on a good day with wind behind it to deliver. 30-fold mismatch. Then it set out a number of strategies, either one called mitigation, which is what the government was doing at the time, or another one called suppression, which is all about an attempt to stamp this out, and argued the case for both, one or t'other, and then presented what would be the likely outcomes if those courses were embraced. And this... I think uh, was was very clear 
it brought to bear new information culled from what was happening in other countries. So it wasn't that the government were ignoring this before and then it slapped them around the face and made them pay attention. It was a resynthesis of, of all the data hitherto presented very clearly in a way that enabled them to, to decide how to bring in these next set of measures. If you recover from COVID-19, and this is the burning question, I think, is there any evidence that you are then immune to it? You definitely become immune to it because you wouldn't clear it from your body otherwise. And we know people clear it because in people who have been confirmed as having been infected, they've had all the symptoms and then they have recovered, subsequent testing has failed to detect virus in these people. That's point one. Point two is that you can detect antibodies that people make which fight off the virus. Point three is that people have experimentally, and this was published just in the last week, and it's an unpeer-reviewed publication, it's very early days, so take this with a pinch of salt, but researchers in China have experimentally transmitted the virus to monkeys, which are a good model for these infections in us. The monkeys develop the same spectrum of illnesses that humans do, and then they clear the virus after a few weeks. And again, you cannot detect any virus in these monkeys. You can detect antibodies in these monkeys. And if you then go back and you reinfect the monkeys, or try to, and at the moment they've only explored one time point, and that was one week, um, sorry, one month after the monkeys recovered, the monkeys couldn't be reinfected. And that proves that at least at the one-month stage, there is protective immunity in these animals and they didn't develop any kind of syndrome. So at the moment, that shows that at one month there's a protective immunity. That is not very long and they acknowledge it's not very long, but it's very early days and I suspect that they'll now publish updates because they'll continue to monitor these animals and see if they remain protected following their exposure. Um, in the subsequent months because this is a critical question to answer both from a human point of view but also from a vaccine perspective because if, if we want to make a vaccine based on the virus we want to make a vaccine that's going to produce lasting immunity or an appreciably lasting immunity and that's going to be critical and if there's a problem with the virus not producing lasting immunity that could pull the rug from under that very important part of our strategy it's all part of the exit clause you know people are trying to say the end game for this is a vaccine that's how we're going to get ourselves out of this mess and if a vaccine might not work in the way we anticipate then that would be a big problem so people are grappling with this right now this is a question that i've been pondering and a couple of listeners have put it much better than i did in my head if we all went into self-isolation for 14 days right now and didn't leave the house, I mean, it's a thought experiment, and then we came out, would the virus get us in the end? In the late noughties, I was in Johannesburg at a conference and I got together with a guy who runs an obstetric clinic in Johannesburg for young black women. And I was asking him, you know, what fraction of your clientele have HIV? Because South Africa is a slightly artificial situation because it is a fairly moneyed country, so people can afford treatment and therefore you end up with a very high, artificially high prevalence of the disease. And he said about 50% of the young women in my clinic have HIV, very well controlled. But then we went on and did the very thought experiment that you have just outlined because we were discussing how these young women caught this and why they caught it at the young age that they did. And he made the point that if everyone in the entire world stopped having sex for about three months, then there would be no more HIV problem. And the reason for that is the vast majority of transmissions of HIV happen at the very first early phases when a person is first infected with HIV. And that's because you get very high levels of virus in you and therefore you're really infectious at the early stages and you don't realise you've got it. And that's where most of the transmissions occur. And after that, when your immune system kicks in, it does control the virus quite well and so your, your infectivity really plummets. So yes, to answer your question about coronavirus, if we isolated the entire world population and we assume that there are no more bats and pangolins knocking around to recombine more of this virus and infect us from nature again, so we assume there's no environmental reservoir, the virus would go away. If but where we do they isolated go? isolated everybody... I mean, somebody else has asked, Gemma's the, just texted to say, yes, yes, but why do viruses such as SARS and indeed this one, why would it appear sweet through population and then seemingly vanish? How do they stop being in circulation? Where do they go? OK, if we consider SARS, 
SARS was a jump. Again, it was a bat coronavirus which jumped in an animal market in China, we believe, via a civet cat. And the reason it went into a civet cat is probably because in the market there was a cage full of bats and next to the cage full of bats was a cage full of civet cats and the civet cats caught the virus off the bats. They became very infectious very quickly because they're not the natural host of that coronavirus and that amplification then pushed the virus into people. So people are not the natural host of this coronavirus that we called SARS. None, nevertheless, it was able to spread and it spread reasonably well and it got to 30 or 40 countries and about 8,000 people got infected. About 800 people died of it. But because it wasn't a natural infection of humans, it declared itself quite dramatically when it occurred. It was quite easy to spot and therefore it was easy for us to stamp it out. This new virus spreads really rather well in mathematical terms, what we call the reproductive number, R0, which is a measure of every time you have a case of it, how many more cases do you create? How many people do you give it to? That number's about two, three, maybe even four for this virus. So it spreads really well. And it seems to be able to infect a lot of people without making them terribly unwell, unlike SARS, which was really quite nasty. So you've got all the makings there of a virus which, unless we take steps to really bear down on it, probably is going to continue to circulate and become a normal human virus that's just going to circulate like other members of the or the hundreds of viruses that cause the common cold. So it varies. Some viruses aren't very good at spreading, so they just fizzle out. Other viruses are very good at spreading and they slowly adapt and accommodate to humans. Humans adapt and accommodate to them and they enter the media of infection that spreads around the world and we're continuously adding to the pool of susceptible people by having babies and they get infected, they get immune and the virus moves on. So what what about the waves that people are talking about? I mean, we, we all do our best here in New Zealand, for example, to contain it um, at the stage... As far as we know, we don't have community transmission. I don't know whether you think that that's a bit of magical thinking, Um, but eventually we might feel like we're under control, but then a new wave might come in as China's experiencing a new wave. At what point do we say it's safe to open our borders now, for example? And this is the massive quandary that everyone is labouring under Mm. because it was this week at the press conference when Boris Johnson, flanked by the Chief Scientific Officer Patrick Vallance and the Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty, presented their manoeuvres that we're all now implementing and presented the rationale for why they were doing this. And suddenly everyone in the room realised that This is not something you do for two weeks. This is not something you do for two months. Potentially, we could be doing this for the best part of a year. But at the end of that time, how do we get out of it? Because all we've done is to hold back the inevitable. If the virus is still circulating elsewhere, it can still come back. And that's the big challenge. And that's currently what people are scratching their heads about, what our exit strategy is we're putting a lot of store by saying well we're going to have some kind of vaccine and it's going to be ready in a hurry and then we can protect people who are at risk with that vaccine and then other people who want to they can just go and catch it but at the moment we don't have a vaccine and we don't have any drugs but we just have these social and mechanisms in order to try to suppress it and bear down on it and reduce the circulation but it's sure as hell not going to go away and the reason for that is there are many countries where there are no control measures and there are many countries where there are no ways to monitor and unless you can do monitoring and surveillance and know what your case burden is and know where the virus is you've no hope of getting rid of it right well that's not very optimistic and distinctly unhelpful thank you chris Um, sorry what about what about hydro hydroxychloroquine which is i think um an anti-malarial drug that appears to have been shown to be useful what's the story there Well, whenever we encounter a a, a disease of some kind, the first thing you do is you understand the mechanism of the disease and then you ask, well, now we know how this thing causes disease. Are there any drugs which, when we throw them at a related disease or syndrome or a related infection, they work? And so people have gone to our medicine chest and they've taken various drugs or chemicals and started throwing them at 
this problem and they they can grow the virus in the dish and you can test various drugs on it you can also do it in a computer you can ask a computer uh can you model for me the structure of this bit of this virus or the mechanism by which the genetic information of this virus works? Are there any drugs or molecules that, that we know of in databases somewhere that might interfere with that process? And one of the candidates that came up was chloroquine, the anti-malarial, and a chemical relative of chloroquine used for some other applications, which is called hydroxychloroquine. And people are now doing tests. They start off in dishes, but then because these drugs already have a license for safe administration to humans, they of course have side effects and one must be careful but because they already have a license and this is the key you can short circuit a lot of the delays which are normally involved in getting drugs for certain things into people because if it's already gone through all the safety trials and it's already got licensing you're just changing the application you're not starting from scratch which means instead of 10 years it can take you know 10 10 days to 10 weeks to get a, a drug approved and, and into people for an application so this is just one drug of a, a whole constellation of chemicals that people are exploring with different levels of success to try to find drugs that might help us to load the dice a bit and tip someone from being what will definitely be a long stay in intensive care and possibly permanent lung damage or even death to someone who's going to recover. I talked to Laura Spinney about this a little earlier. Um, you know, President Trump is saying, oh, we never saw this coming. Um, this despite, I mean, and this is a triumph for science, really. All those people who haven't been listening to scientists might now listen a bit more closely because scientists have been saying there will be a pandemic. Had people listened to the scientists, Chris, what could we have done in order to prevent it? Mm. It's sobering, but I went and got the lecture I gave in 2007 off my computer the other day, and I was teaching the medical students, the vet students, and the natural science students at the University of Cambridge about emerging infections. And the talk opened with a discussion of SARS from 2003 and why that happened and reviewed the mechanisms of many other s subsequent disease emergencies including speculating that Ebola might be a problem so that was coming seven years ahead and the mechanisms I presented were a change in the pathogen in other words something changes about a virus a change in the host so something changes about the thing that's carrying it um, or some other range of changes such as the environment of the planet changes or usually a combination of all of them and the one thing I point to is population because there's now 7.5 plus billion people on earth when I wrote that lecture there was about 6.5 billion people on earth and the rate of growth of human population is about 1% per year. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like very much. In fact, if I got that much interest on my bank balance, I'd be delighted. Mm. And actually, if you do the compound interest formula, where you take the rate of growth, so that's 101 over 100, which is the rate of growth in a year, and you raise it to the power of X, where X is a certain number of years, uh, you can find out what your money will be worth in X number of years' time. You can do the same for the population, of course, by multiplying 101 over 100 raised to the power of x times population. And the answer is that if you do those sums, you can find a value of x that will double your population. And the value of x is 75 years. So in other words, in less than the time that the average person is going to live that's listening to this program, you could double the number of humans on Earth the way we're going. And we're all using two planets worth of resources each per year. And it's just not sustainable. It's forcing us to rape nature, build all over the virgin rainforest and basically push nature to the very brink. And when you push things into a genetic corner, then bizarre stuff starts to happen. And that's exactly effectively what's happened in China. So high population density, bring these animals into markets, put massive high density crates of animals next to animals they would never normally interact with in the wild, facilitate a jump of a pathogen, and then you've got the perfect mechanism, very high density population and a very mobile population to spread it around the world for you. And there you go. Well, yeah, that that essentially you're saying that there's no way we could have given our population and our way of living, there is no way we could have avoided this. Is that what you're saying? Uh, if we carry on going the way we're going, no. If people had decided that perhaps there are too many people on Earth and, and really took that seriously and took the fact that we are changing the planet in ways that's going to force nature into closer and closer proximity to people, 
if if we if we'd taken that stance and and actually begun to to row back then it's possible i suppose that it would be less likely to happen but i think we've gone too far there's just too many people and we we've got to take this seriously because the reason we're laboring under all these problems of climate change and wars and this that and the other is because there are too many people and if you had people if you had probably about 2 billion people on earth that would be an ideal number not to destroy the planet but with 7 and a half billion and rising probably going to exceed 10 billion possibly even 12 billion by mid century the earth can't take that there are people who are concerned that covid-19 leads to permanent lung damage is there any evidence of that there is for SARS and we're reading into the data from SARS what might happen with this virus they are different agents though and they have different levels of pathogenicity in other words how they make us ill and how badly they make us ill and so therefore one must be cautious about extrapolating one to the other but it's certainly true that both of these viruses infect the lungs they cause inflammation in the lungs they cause in some cases such severe inflammation that they can lead to a condition called fibrosis where you lay down thickened levels of fibrous tissue in the lungs and this does two things one it makes the lungs stiffer so it's harder to get the air in in the first place and and also it thickens all of the membranes inside your lungs increasing the distance between where the blood is that needs the oxygen and where the air sacs are that have got the oxygen and that makes the lungs less efficient and there is evidence that people who recovered from SARS in some cases did have lifelong subsequent changes to the way their lungs worked so that could be a risk with this one but we don't know yet because it's so early days somebody asks whether a person in self isolation could be tested for covid-19 before the end of the 14 days and if they are clear can they then come out of isolation or is there no. an insufficient <laughs> level of virus no you're stuck there because the virus yeah. might not develop until around 14 days is that the idea yeah that's right tests uh, have what are called false negatives and in fact i have had one in our own laboratory recently where we tested somebody using a nose and throat swab and i was then uh, party to a phone call from the hospital where they had been admitted and were then in intensive care and uh by then and one of the uh, staff then said can we send you some more samples and i got them to send me some samples from deeper down in the lungs and those samples were roasting hot positive yeah and what was going on is that basically when those people were initially tested nose and throat swab is not very sensitive for picking up this virus it, it prefers to be in the lungs not in the nose and throat and it was very early in the disease course for them so they weren't making appreciable amounts of virus at that time so they were missed and then it was only later when they developed full blown symptoms and became very severely unwell that then we could get samples from in the lungs where the virus was and prove that yes that's definitely what it is so the answer is a there's an incubation period and the incubation period is a about 11 days maximum but you can never say never in medicine in some cases it might be longer in some people who have partial immunity or, or or to something else for example there's all kinds of possible get out clauses so one's always a bit cautious about this but 11 days probably so we use 14 as a a guideline to give us a safety margin but it's always possible for someone to present on day 11 so if you did a swab on day 10 oh you look negative false reassurance so it's very important not to not to jump the gun with this and to to make sure that you test properly good advice thank you for that um another one here if viruses mutate and they do and this is an rna virus so i think it may not mutate so quickly but it will still mutate do you think based on what you were saying earlier that the mutation will not lead to a more virulent virus but may lead to a less virulent virus given the virus's need to survive do you know what i mean viruses use either dna like our cells do as their genetic information or rna and rna is a chemical relative of dna but unlike dna where there are two chains of genetic information wound around each other one the mirror image of the other rna is a single strand of genetic information 
And when we copy DNA in our cells, the enzymes that do that copying read and check that they've made one copy the perfect mirror image of the other. And in that way, the message is faithfully transmitted. And that's why DNA is an amazing molecule for storing information. But viruses that don't use DNA and instead use RNA are therefore much more prone to genetic spelling mistakes. These are called mutations. And this is a bit like you being in class and copying down notes off the blackboard, but occasionally you mistake some of the word spellings and you put the wrong letter in. And so when these viruses copy themselves, if they don't have another strand to compare what they've just copied against, they, they have no way of knowing if they've accidentally introduced a genetic spelling mistake and that's a mutation that then changes the nature of the virus. And this can, it sounds bad, but actually it can be very advantageous for the virus because in some cases it will enable it to evolve and adapt very quickly because if you've got a virus producing millions of copies of itself and say one in every 10,000 viruses has made a genetic spelling mistake, OK, in many cases that genetic spelling mistake may make either no difference or might make a difference and make the virus less fit and less healthy, but in some cases it might just give it some exciting new property or the ability to, say, sidestep an antiviral drug or get into cells more rapidly or grow a bit faster. And because that will, that will be advantageous, you'll then select for that particular genetic change in the virus and slowly the population will begin to be dominated by this new strain which has got that genetic change in it. So all viruses can do this, all life mutates, but some viruses that use RNA tend to do it more often and that means that they can be more genetically agile and that can confer certain advantages for them. People are watching this coronavirus, which is an RNA virus, very carefully to look at this. And at the moment there's no evidence that this is making any kind of progression towards uh, weaponizing or ad adopting more virulent mutations and this is despite the fact that we're putting quite a lot of selective pressure on the virus really pushing it hard by putting all these stringent measures in place making it harder and harder for it to spread so in fact we're going to select for viruses that are really quite good at spreading and at the moment we're not seeing a dramatic change but this is being looked at and this may change which is why people are being cautious and keeping an eye on it but wouldn't it be in the virus's interest not to harm the host so much. Yeah, and if you look at what happens when you get a, an incursion of a virus into a new host, when it first goes into a new host, you generally get dramatic mortality. And then what happens is you select for a population of hosts that are a bit more resilient, because they're the survivors, and you select for a population of viruses that don't kill off too many of their hosts, because then they would have no one left to breed in. Yeah. And a really good example of this is actually HIV, because HIV comes from SIV, which is simian immunodeficiency virus. This was a chimpanzee virus, and probably um, 100 years ago we think HIV came into being because people were exposed to SIV from chimpanzees. And that HIV obviously has ripped through the world and it's caused 100 plus million deaths since that jump. But what it has disclosed is that there are humans on Earth, they are represented at low level in our gene pool, but they are completely resistant to HIV. And there are other humans on Earth who can be infected, but they are very good at controlling the virus and it doesn't cause them any harm, but they're just infected with it and they carry it. So one could say, logically, what would happen in the long term is you would slowly select for a population of humans, given no antiviral drugs, no knowledge of this, no practices to stamp it out, you would select for a population of humans that were very good at controlling HIV and, of, and, and, and a virus that was very good at tolerating being controlled. And that's exactly what's happened in chimpanzees and other, other apes where they catch this, these SIV-like viruses and it doesn't cause their immune system to disintegrate with the same rate that, that HIV destroys our immune system at the moment. Oh, so many questions. Look, if, as you said earlier, you need 14 days to determine whether somebody has got COVID-19 or not, then... <clears throat> that when we test people, they're likely to be lots and lots of false negatives because they haven't had the 14 days. Do you know what I mean? 
generally in the population. Yes, and that's that's happening, and that's the case in point I gave you when I said we tested these two people yep. and said, well, we can't find the virus in and these people, so, and that's happening. My next question is, what do you think our chances are of not having community transmission right now. We are told that we haven't, although that could change in the next hour or the next day. But what do you think the chances are of actually not having community transmission at this point? I think, I don't want to pour water on anyone's fire, but I think pretty low that, mm. that, that it's not happening. Um, it's, it's very easy to transmit. It hides in plain sight because of the fact that the symptoms masquerade as other coughs and colds and for that reason it's quite easy for it to, to be bumbling along and us not notice it and I, I'm convinced that there is quite a big undercurrent of activity spreading through in, in the majority of countries because it escaped and the genie was out of the bottle from China for a long time before people began to really say well hang on a minute are we entirely happy about this should we be closing airports should we be screening people etc so I suspect there is in many countries low grade uh, transmission through populations and it may just fizzle out um, or it may just continue to propagate in a low grade way until it really begins to take off but what we need is population level screening and there are now tests being developed good quality tests which are going to look for antibodies and they're going to look for antibodies that you make when you get the virus and recover from it and then make a class of antibodies called IgG antibodies and this will tell you a that the person's immune but b they have been exposed to this virus and we can then start to screen uh, random cohorts of, of samples from the population and this will give us some idea as to what we call the zero prevalence how many people is this really infected in the population at some point and then we'll get answers to these sorts of questions and that's coming because people realize how critical that sort of information is You've only got a minute to answer this question. It seems to me to be quite a clever one. If someone, if someone is at higher risk from the virus, say asthmatic, would it be better for them to deliberately get infected early on before the health services are overwhelmed? My boss at uh, Addenbrooke's Hospital at the Cambridge University said to me, uh, as someone in his 60s dubbed, judged to be at high risk, he said, I'm almost tempted to go and infect myself tomorrow while there's still some ventilators left in the hospital so I can get this over and done with and I will be OK. So great minds and all that. I dare say that you're not recommending that, however. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it, but my boss said it to me. All right. <laughs> you're just the messenger, so I won't shoot you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks Please don't, once Kim. again. You're welcome. Stay Good to talk well. to you. Chris Smith.